Welcome to the 168th webinar presented by KCOR, the Canadian Association for the Club of Rome. I'm Ruben Nelson, one of the directors of KCOR, and I am host for this webinar. We are in for a treat. David Harries will speak to us on the topic, Goals for Everything for All. Again? Maybe a few. Afterwards, he will engage the questions posed to him by those who are at the live presentation. You can read one version of David's life on the slide before you. I want to offer a more personal welcome and introduction. David and I have come to know each other over the last 38 years. In 1985, David, then a full colonel, was recognized as having one of the best minds in the Canadian Armed Forces when he was appointed as Head of Studies and Deputy Commandant of the National Defence College in Kingston. He was responsible for the design and content of the 40-week elite course, which prepared senior people in the Canadian Armed Forces and in the Armed Forces of NATO allies and in selected Canadian institutions, including the Government of Canada, for the most senior positions in those organizations. The course centered on this question, what policy, for what Canada, for what world? You can see that David sees and thinks contextually. For years, David squired the people on that course to every part of Canada and to most countries in the world. David has lived on every continent and had a working visit to 114 countries. As you will see, he pays attention to his surroundings, his intuitive and inquiring mind, and his open heart never close. You cannot have a better colleague and friend. David, on behalf of KCOR, welcome. Over to you. Ruben, thank you very much. You, one of my best and longest friends. Um, thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm an hour past having finished preparing this presentation. It's in black and white here because it's been a long haul to put together this package so that it wasn't incoherent. Full disclosure right at the beginning. I was asked in April by colleagues in the Security and Sustainability Guide, will something follow the Sustainable Development Goals? And it sort of opened my mind because everybody was talking about it being the halfway point. And I thought that was a really good question. So a little bit prematurely, I called Art and I said, how about a talk on this? And you can tell me later today whether it was fortunately or unfortunately, I said yes. But I can tell you the last three months have been living in a rabbit hole because I had no idea how much I didn't know. And therefore I start with a little statement about some of the slides you'll see. Because of the masses of information, I have kept some of them on slides. And I will tell you which ones you don't have to read because if you did, we'd be here all afternoon. But at least they're a reference if you want to follow up on some of my ideas. 
Some of you who have seen another of my presentations will remember this slide, and it's very important for what is happening right now vis-a-vis -vis things like the Sustainable Development Goals. You control some things if they're with you. You can't control other things if they're without. But the big issue is every human being on earth has a unique suite of biases, assumptions, and interests, and that never stops changing. So we are, in effect, eight plus billion agents on dealing with the goals. Let's start with what I figure is the first goal in this field. Back in 1970, it was introduced by the World Council of Churches, the idea of a percentage of a country's gross national product being dedicated, committed to overseas development assistance. During the 60s, the number varied and some objected to it, but it was between 1% and 0.75%. But in 1969, the whole concept of overseas development assistance was formalized by the Pearson Commission. And then there was a UN resolution in October of 1970 that rich countries would provide 0.7% of GDP to overseas development assistance. It's important to note that not everybody agreed and some of the people that didn't agree were in a way surprising. I've listed two there. The important thing is that over the next half a century, this 0.7% has been repeatedly endorsed at the highest level everywhere. In 1993, the metric was changed from GNP to gross national income, uh, but it didn't change the commitment metric. 2005, the 15 members of the European Union, as it was in 2004, agreed to meet the target by 2015. And this was all backed up at Glen Eagles in the World Summit. Today's 2023, 25 August, 0.7% is still the goal. But only eight countries have ever reached that goal at least once. Remember, some context for 1970. You know my fixation on context. It was sort of stable. There were two sides in the Cold War. It was pre-decolonization, pre-internet. It was the fall of 1970 that the first 747 pa passenger flight flew. It was pre-climate change alarms. The UN had only 127 members. It was pre-limits to growth. And the Vietnam War was on. As I went through some of my research, I kept feeling that this 0.7% commitment was sort of a Western version of a first Belt and Road campaign. If people have comments on that, I'd really enjoy taking them up. Next, 30 years later, the Millennium Development Goals. Eight goals. Don't worry about reading the whole slide. The important thing here is that the Millennium Development Goals were very, were developed in a very complicated way by a team of technicians with some support from 22 non-governmental organizations. The eight goals had 21 targets, each with a specific date. At first, the focus was on water issues. And then a review conference in September 2010, so we're now a decade into the work on the goals, decided that all new commitments needed to target women and children's health 
and a worldwide battle against poverty, hunger, and disease. In 2013, there was another report. There was very uneven progress. In some cases, none. Something I didn't know, Canada, over the period of the Millennium Development Goals, actually pledged a total over three or four of the goals of $1.7 billion, which was a lot of money in those days. Now, there didn't seem to be any apparent connection to that 1970 OECD 0.7 commitment, or I've never seen one. But the link is on there for a very fulsome explanation of the Millennium Development Goals. 2000, here's some more context for the year, around the year. 191 members in the UN. Global population had made it up to 6.2 billion. Internet was emerging. It was quite a lot of chaos after the Cold War stability with self-determination. We were sort of at mid-decolonization. And you'll all remember Francis Fukuyama's book, The End of History, and Thomas Friedman's article and book, The World is Flat, and then Richard Free Florida backed that up, or sort of came back at him with saying, well, there's spikes, the spikes being the huge increase in urban areas. A lot of people were waiting for the peace dividend. And who can forget the Y2K scare? I know myself, a whole floor in National Defense Headquarters in Ottawa was turned over for a sort of operation center, what we were going to do when the world came to an end because of Y2K. The USSR had failed, and the United Nations Human Security Campaign had one of its best years. So, second set of goals for all. You can read over almost an hour the Wikipedia statement, which has a lot of interesting but often contradictory information. One of the problems during this period was that the growth of security and sustainability organizations and security and sustainability, if they aren't partners, then they're enemies. The number of organizations just skyrocketed between what amounts to the beginning of the Second World War and, and the middle of the last decade. And from our impressions in the security and sustainability guide, since 2016, the increase has remained virtually exponential. I know every day I add to a trailer list of organizations that we want to perhaps consider of at least nine every day in my reading. Some background to the security development goals. There doesn't appear I couldn't find any influence from the MDGs, from the Millennium Development Goals, their progress or their outcomes. Didn't seem to be any a connection to the 0.7% commitment. It was back in 2012 that the then United Nations Secretary General called for a post-MDG agenda. And he gathered, There's the number varies, 30 experts, and I don't understand this, but I'm quoting from two sets of literature, representing 70 countries to help him develop the next goals for all. The focus was to be on gender, education, and health issues. That was a follow-on indirectly from positions during the Millennium Development Goals. 2015 Agenda 2030 began, based primarily on the General Assembly Resolution, the future we want. But it wasn't until 2017 that the UN published targets and indicators for each goal. And the numbers are 
almost overwhelming. You remember I said Canada did more than one and a half billion for the MDGs. One of the shocks for me as I went through preparations for this was Canada invested 59.8 million from 2018 to 2031. And very recently, the Secretary General has reiterated what he wants 2020 to 2030 to be, a decade of action. Thirty plus experts, plus extensive consultations, and this cartoon. I, I can't object to it. I think it's a little caustic, but now the important thing to realize as we look forward to another set, if we're going to have one, is that the Millennium Development Goals, if they weren't versus, they certainly weren't equal or similar to the Sustainable Development Goals. And the reference at the bottom of this page, don't look at all these things. 17 differences in great detail. One with eight goals, one with 17 goals. One with 21 targets, one with 169 targets. One with 60 indicators, the other with 232 indicators. The MDGs are about the present. The SDGs are about everything. The past, the present, and upcoming challenges. But the word foresight doesn't appear. 2016, some context. Don't have to go beyond 2016 to get lots of really interesting context. Uh, this was a hot year. Uh, in brackets at the top there, I point out that Crimea was in Russia by then, since 2014. And Russia was in eastern Ukraine. And that was a agent for some of the discussions uh, and disagreements of 2016. Mass terrorist attacks, the Paris Agreement signed, attempted coup in Turkey, Brexit, Trump was elected president. The presidents in Brazil and South Korea were not only impeached, but jailed. The Goddard Tunnel opens, a huge 20-year massive infrastructure project. Duterte was elected Philippines president. DPRK carried out some nuclear tests. And relative to what we've just heard on the news today and over the last two weeks, United Nations Security Council Resolution 2334 of 2016 condemned Israeli settlements in Paris, Palestinian territories. So I asked my question, goals again? As I did my research, I was looking for the word goals, but it very quickly was obvious that there's a whole bunch of words for goals. And there's a whole bunch of ways that people take goals seriously or not. Here we are in 2023, thinking about goals for our future, overwhelming, interconnected, churning complexity. Nobody and nobody in control, but every, with every, the internet and social media and AI, everybody and everybody can be in charge. Uh, the link on the right, the YouTube link, is Van Morrison's song, Nobody in Charge. John Lennon said a number of interesting things. This is one of them. And the meeting on the left seems to sum up today. But for me, and a project I'm involved in is that 2023 is the year of peak unprecedentedness. 
Don't worry about the list. But very early on, Thomas Friedman, reacting to one of the many, many things that happened, said this was not the plan. And later, as you look through the list, agree or disagree, you have comments or reactions. I'd be most interested to hear them because they will all be part of my the report of my project. And recently, Frank Bruni, a New York Times journalist, wrote a column in which he complained about two words being overused. One was iconic, but for my purposes, it was unprecedented. Being overused was the, was the most interesting side. 2024 goal matters, so next year. A presidential election will have results. I am unable to imagine results that will make America happy again. <clears throat> At the UN, there will be summit of the future, which for reasons now known, was postponed from 2023, so from uh, this year. So we postpone thinking about the future. But for me, it's the title that's upsetting. Summit of the future, as if we knew what the future is going to be. Better for the future or on the future, but we don't know what the future is. The United Nations Secretary General created our common agenda. I think that's a misnomer of the highest order. And some of the discussion that backs me up on that is in the in the link there. More in 2024, there will be more climate change consequences. See pictures today of that hurricane hitting Mexico that went from a one to a five in less than 24 hours. Ukraine will continue. The Middle East will continue. Taiwan, I don't know whether it will continue. Russia, is there any truth at all to the fact that Putin is terminally ill? And North Korea, the one-man leader is very committed. And these will all impact any goals that might be discussed at the UN or elsewhere. Meanwhile, between now and 2024, just a few months, the Kyoto Accord COP28 is happening next month. They have four purposes, four goals. The World Academy of Art and Science, very busy these days. The Security and Sustainability Guide has five purposes. Human Security for All has a number of purposes. Existential Risks for Humanity has several purposes. And Education for Human Security has a number of purposes. The International Conferences on Science and World Affairs, Pugwash, the policy review team some years ago, we created eight goals, uh, priority goals. The Millennium Project, 15 Global Challenges. The Club of Rome, those of you who saw the excellent presentation, I think two weeks ago, learned about five turnarounds, goals. The International Institute of Sustainable Development reports from the UN, from OECD, from a massive number of meetings. In fact, I get a daily report every single day of meetings. I mean, I, there's no way I'd have time to read them all. EcoCity building, Builders has a major campaign on city improvement with many goals. The Rockefeller Foundation just came out with its book that it's promoting on big bets. I Big bets, meaning betting that these will be good things to do. The World Sustainability Forum, which I'll refer to in a minute, has many goals. The Earth Negotiations Bulletin has many goals. The Interaction Council, in partnership with the World Youth Council, has a strategy X that it's promoting. And something I learned about and 
since haven't heard much about the Geneva Science and Diplomacy Anticipator. A little more on that in a minute. And finally, what I just found yesterday, the coalition for the UN we need. And of course, there are lots of these uh, alphanumerical abbreviations uh, that we can have for dinner. Down in small print below, Amnesty International, Transparency International, the Washington Post Climate Coach, the Human Rights Council, the G7, the G20, the Quad, the Quint, the Non-Aligned Movement, they all have goals. The Sustainability and Security Guide, which has been in purpose, and I'm happy to see my boss, Mike Marion, is with us today. Uh, we have five purposes. One of the five is to try to do something with the gazillions of silos that exist that don't have windows or doors or communicate with other silos. And therefore, the only picture I could find that was a silo that had been converted into a little house. But we have so much effort, so much time, so much money spent duplicating what others are doing without knowing it, and in some cases, frankly, without caring, that I think this is a tragedy. So we have to get more communication among organizations engaged on like causes. The Millennium Project, now into its third decade, the state of the future, goals with 15 challenges or the goal of dealing with 15 challenges. Earth for All, which again was the subject of that presentation two weeks ago. Uh, during the presentation, the speaker presented a slide that wasn't included in the video that we all received afterwards that for me was the most valuable and the most interesting. I went to the new book, the 2022 book, Earth for All, from the Club of Rome, and finally found uh, the slide. And it hasn't been cut and trimmed, but the issue here is that Earth for All has seriously considered what the sustainable development goals are. So much so that they have assigned all 17 sustainable de development goals to their five goals, the five turnarounds. Turnarounds, poverty, inequality, empowerment, food, and energy. Now I have lots of discussion with myself and some with others about how they've packaged these, but at very least they're related, interrelated seen together, synergistic. I mentioned the World Sustainability Goal, the uh, World Sustainability Forum. Uh, I attach here a piece of correspondence from Kenneth Stokes uh, because it relates very much to what happened at the UN recently and what may happen in the future about the future of humanity, the future of the planet. There's a lot of disagreement about our common agenda. There's a lot of disagreement about the summit of the future. But the World Sustainability Goal has proposed establishing something that I think is outstanding uh, and a point that I raised in my presentation here to KCOR back in March on accountability, that establish a commission on human responsibility. But that would only be part of the story. And therefore, I even more support the forum advocating for a globally networked systemic risk foresight facility 
and this ties into our project in the World Academy of Existential Risk for Humanity. But we're the, a commission on human responsibility and one on systemic risk foresight facility brought to bear would be a huge improvement in our ability to prepare for what might be coming. To my knowledge, the UN Secretary General has not yet replied to the request. GESDA, Geneva Science and Diplomacy Anticipator, to bridge government policy and science. The link to tell you about it is at the bottom of the slide. Link anticipation, looking forward, foresight, with action that is immediate. This recognizes that what is happening today and how we deal with it should take account of what might be happening tomorrow and how we might deal with that so that we don't go off on a tangent that the minute today is over is not useful. Okay, new goals. You might have implied already that I'm less than 50% for a new set of goals. But given that I asked the question, I tried to answer it. So I said, new goals. What, what are the criteria for suggesting a new goal? Well, that the goal is needed that I can imagine it, that it's technologically plausible, that it's humanly, human beings today are capable of doing it if they're allowed, if the space is there, and if it's financially affordable. But I admit all the obstacles in the face of a new set of goals acceptance of a new set of goals, implementation of a new set of goals. So I tried three. And I picked 2045. And I do that for two main reasons. One is because the last two sets of goals were both 15-year time frames. 2000, 2015, and 2015 to 2030. And the second reason is because with the size of the challenges of any goals that we make in the face of all that is happening today, current challenges, threats, risks, conflicts, I don't think Anything less than 15 years will be even enough time to get started. And I, again, point out my suspicions uh, by noting their sort of visions or flights of fancy. My three goals. A World Supreme Court 2045. I think it's a given that justice delayed is at best poor justice. Tens of thousands of possible crimes have been suspected, alleged, or verified only in one conflict, only by one side. So there are tens of tens of thousands that are candidates for justice. Whether those who are charged are guilty or not, but justice delayed is poor justice. But we have a mass of justice systems. There's the International Court of Justice way back 1945. 
one of the six principal organs of the United Nations that deals with crimes by states. We have the International Criminal Court stood up in 2002 to prosecute individuals. But we also have only occasionally remembered the universal jurisdiction over genocide that every state on earth can deploy under conventional international law. I, I think from what I read, there's only been three cases where, uh, in Britain anyway, where it's been used. And of course, we have the courts of 193 sovereign UN member states. That's a lot of justice moving slowly, while what justice is needed, the amount of justice needed, is racing ahead. Third, or second, possibility. United Nations Security Council 2. At birth, the 51 members had a Security Council of the P5 plus 5 in a two-year rotation with monthly presidency changes, which meant, of course, that a, a geopolitical minnow could be followed by a geopolitical whale as the president every 30, 28, 30, or 31 days. In 1965, there were 117 members. The P5 still, of course, plus 10. So five more were added in the two-year rotation. And there was no change with this monthly presidency. I mean, I don't know any business that would do very well changing their president every month. Uh, especially when the president might not know a great deal about what are the issues of the day. And here we are in 2023, 193 members, still P5 plus 10. And something I didn't know was that after seven decades, 61 UN members have never been in the United Nations Security Council. And there's reasons for that, I guess, good and bad. Uh, but the representational basis rather than the meritocracy basis, certainly is one of them. So my proposal is that in 2045, the UN United Nations Security Council has Brazil and India as permanent members. When I say permanent, I don't mean we're going to a P7. I mean, we're going to a P5 plus small p2. They don't rotate. So we get away from this monthly musical chairs, we have the United Nations Secretary General is the president, the permanent president. And a vice president operation is a second, so a new UN Deputy Secretary General. From what I understand, the current Deputy Secretary General is a very busy person on very important issues. Now, of interest, as I'm doing my research, up comes this very interesting article, the link to it below. There's a very large group of people calling for charter review, review of the charter. I've got a picture of it there, uh, of the book, and uh, the charter report is 53 pages. So there's support here, and there is more and more support for trying to lift the United Nations Secu Security Council out of a period of near irrelevance. Okay, here is my third and least confident flight of fancy. But I had to do it because I have been highly impressed by the number of times I've seen this line. This was not the plan when something unprecedented has happened only this year. And this was not the plan. This is my view. 
because we didn't look ahead honestly enough and in time to gain the insights into what have been, if not on the radar screen, anticipated in enough detail to plan to be better prepared. Whether we do it or not, that's another thing. But we haven't been very well prepared for some of the unprecedented events and conditions, even though in many cases we knew or we could have known. So my very, very, very flimsy new suggestion of a goal is a Kyoto Accord-like consortium of public, private, and civil society organizations that are formally active in foresight. We need funds. Well, if people would join self-funded, I don't know. Billionaires, there seem to be more every day. How many of the billionaires would want to be known for helping improve the prospects for human security, state security, and biodiversity security by being better prepared for what is happening? A global tax? I don't know. But I would see the executive, including this World Youth Council, which the Interaction Council has helped stand up, the Geneva Science and Diplomacy Acceler Anticipator, it's anticipation, and the elders. Bertie O'Hearn is involved, and uh, I here I might be invited to one of the meetings for as a foresight person. I'm going to fall right off the edge and say thank you because had this event not happened now, say until next month, I would still be working on the presentation because of how much I still have to learn. Thank you. David, uh, what a stunning tour de force. Um, I thought I had started my video. There we are. You will be formally thanked later. Uh, now it's time to uh, probe, um, <clears throat> as we do with a roasted turkey at Christmas, to kind of see if it's done. And uh, what bits are overdone and uh, we'll probe and push at you. So I invite people to put questions in the chat. <clears throat> Let me... Uh, begin with um, an initial question, a and that is, um, if you take the, I mean, the, the the detail with which you've done this raises for me the question: Is it seriously conceivable that we, who are <clears throat> modern people, because all that you've talked about has come out of modernity. It's after the Second World War when modernity dominates the world. And is it conceivable that we have to begin to think about the possibility that modernity itself is ill-suited to even understand, much less cope with, the issues that it's wrestling with, and that all these exercises in goals and whatever else are uh, really will amount to so little that they will not make the kind of differences in the time that we have, because we now know, as we didn't know in 1945, that our time to act is limited. Uh, so are we hooped? To put it in a way my daughter would ask it. We hooped. Um, I, I spent a lot of my life in sports. And when you say goal, whether it's a soccer goal or a hockey goal or a penalty goal in rugby or whatever, uh, there's a thing here about winning and losing. And that is one of the reasons the whole idea of goals for all 
worries me big time because it immediately asks the question, is this about winning or losing? And the issues we have now, whether you call it the poly crisis or the perma crisis or whatever, uh, it's bigger than winning and losing. This is a crisis. And if we're serious, the one goal we have is to tamp this poly crisis down to the point that its elements slow enough that we can reverse the trend. Uh, I'll contradict myself by saying one of the reasons, one of the few reasons another set of goals appeals to me is at very least it keeps people talking, even if they disagree that, that this goal or that goal needs to be done now or can be done now. But I, I worry that when you set up a large number of goals, I mean, if we follow the trend, eight millennium development goals, 17 sustainable development goals, we got more and more problems, it seems. Are we going to have 35 next set of goals? And who's responsible? It's another reason the sustainability forums recommendation and it's a very good recommendation and and layout for a council on responsibility really makes sense to me who's responsible and who's accountable for these goals it's free for it's a bubble zone so um are we hooped well we're certainly in a situation where we we need individually and collectively to fight to stay afloat acceptably well. Um, I'd have to think about the shape of the hoop. That's a terrible answer. <laughs> there, there may not be any good answers to terrible questions. Um, <clears throat> Gabriella, if you would turn on your uh, camera and microphone, um, yours will be the first question. Raymond, you will be up um, so you can prepare. Okay, thanks, Ruben. And um, hello, David. Hi. So it's it's Bill Ban from Newfoundland and myself. I saw you yeah. there, yeah. So um, we noticed a few things, and we um, were commenting on two of your um, uh, uh, slides. I think the first one that Bill uh, noticed was something that USA was missing. And so it's all about context, like you said. Mm -hmm. But if you zoom on all the countries or, or that were there, you had Russia and Korea and so on. Um, was USA supposed to be there too? That's um, the first question. Okay. Uh, I guess, um, uh, of course. Uh, right. I thought in my mind, I sort of included that with next year with the presidential election results. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, for me, um, the, from now until the election day, what is it, 8 November or something November, there's going to be all sorts of exciting things happen, good and bad, uh, mostly bad. But for me, the future of the United States depends on the results. And I'm having a hard time thinking of a result that means the United States is going to be less stressed. Um, and therefore, I, I, uh, I beg your forgiveness that I thought I included the U.S. by having the presidential election in there. Because uh, in, in my view, it's not just the presidential election. It's a lot more what's happening mm -hmm. in the state. Yeah, I, I right. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. So and and the other one was about I remember the the, the uh, uh, you were mentioning establishing um uh, a oh. commission on um 
human accountability. Human responsibility. And um, responsibility, yeah. accountability and responsibility. And um, I, I, we it thought... Can't, yeah. It can't, basically, you can't have a general human responsibility of all the individuals involved. They all have to be part of it. Different. But in separate, different situations where everybody's needs are different, everybody's desires are different, and so Values. on down the line. Does that make sense? Values and cultures. Yeah. Um, another reason I have problems with goals in hope partially answer your concern uh, we're refocused again on human security and that's about individuals and that's one of the reasons I put up that contact slide at the beginning that every human being is different and human beings make an effort to preserve or maintain their human security as and how they see fit. And what worries me is all these great big goals come down from on high. And usually they're from probably rightfully uh, developed by experts who don't have any human security concerns, whether they're wealth or shelter or safety or, or anything. And yet, Probably a majority of the world's citizens, the humanity, um, aren't that well off. And so I, I am still having trouble coming to terms with, I go back to the Canadian foreign policy, 2005, freedom from fear and freedom from want. Well, freedom is from the top, but it's also from the bottom. And Every human being's got to be involved. So every goal, the goals in Ottawa are different from the goals here in Kingston for well-being. And who's responsible or who's not responsible. Uh, yeah. Um, I don't have an answer. I, again, I say, if if this had not happened today, I'd still be working on my presentation. No, I mean, uh, I I didn't think there was an answer. I th I think it's some it, it's a continuing communication on this. Thank you, thank you both. Thank you, Ted Manning. You will be up next, and uh, Raymond, if you would ask your question or make your comment. Uh, hi, David. Uh, thanks for a very, uh, another thought provoking presentation. I think we could all agree that the UN uh, could use some level of reform. Um, I, I didn't see many questions earlier, so I, so I want to ask you a question that's a bit more detailed about something you said earlier in the presentation. You talked about silos and the fact that we have lots of silos working um, in parallel, but not really communicating really well. And one of my big frustrations uh, here in Ottawa is that we have a whole bunch of different uh, groups that are environmentally focused, uh, but they all work on their own. So they, to, to me, it's like having a huge bureaucracy that takes a lot, of, you know, takes a lot of energy, spend a lot of, spends a lot of time talking about stuff, but they don't actually get to do that much stuff, right? So, so do you see a role for KCOR in trying to help us um, overcome some of that? Um, what was it, five five years ago? It's 17 or 18, I, I gave a presentation I, in a seminar, a, a, an event on foresight. And I think we've seen in this country that our government doesn't do that very well. And I agree with your point about you know, all talk, no action, because if every a whole bunch of people are involved in doing something, they all want to get together and talk about what they're doing, uh, if it's possible. And the more time you spend talking, the less time you spend acting or doing things, something tangible. Uh, my, I, I, I mean, I haven't thought about KCOR specifically. 
and I don't know, I don't know anymore. KCOR could have a role in helping Canada think forward better, but I don't know who you're going to tell that to anymore. <laughs> I, I just don't see a, a target audience for good advice. I, 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 that's a pretty brutal way to put it as a Canadian, but I, that's, yeah. Uh, you know, op-eds, you, I mean, another unprecedented thing for me this year is we have National Post articles and Globe and Mail articles, which in less than four hours have more than a thousand comments. And they're, some of them are brutal. And there is no agreement. I mean, a few years ago, I know this because I'm, I've always been a bit of a news wonk. Uh, if you got 20 for an article, it was sort of successful. But we're in such a talk mode, argument mode, about right now, whether it's the article or, or, or the subject in Canada or whatever, that we aren't looking ahead. And tomorrow will come. So if KCOR picked, I don't know, one or two themes and created, I don't know, a newsletter on looking ahead on those two themes for Ottawa, for Canada, for the world, uh, at least it would be interesting. It might even find space in universities. Because I know myself from some of my work that university students, especially in graduate social and political science, <laughs> don't trust their government. <laughs> to look ahead, to, to, to care for them. And the reason I bring up the youth as often as I often do is because whether we like it or not, they're gonna be the leaders soon. And they have the most skin in this game. If they can't stop what's happening now, their future isn't gonna be any better. And I've been at a couple of conferences in, in overseas where highly selected young professionals were vitriolic in their criticism of the poobahs sitting in the front rows in the reserved seats. I remember a conference in Baku in, in 2014 or 15 or something. There were 71 uh, current or past presidents, prime ministers, or whatever in the audience. And they had had a couple of panels beforehand. And then there were two panels of 18 of these young professionals selected from all over the world. It was brutal. You have failed us. We have so much to recover from. We can't make plan. Uh, anyway, it was brutal. So how do we help? KCOR can help the young and the young professionals become better prepared. I'd have to think exactly how that would do. Um, Lectures, webinars in universities. Yeah. We have to get started for the next generation of leaders. Is that? <laughs> well, I, I, I think one of the things you're pointing out is it's not an easy problem to solve, right? So, <laughs> uh, and uh, I haven't found solutions that, that seem to work. So, um, yeah, <laughs> we'll leave it at oh, that. <laughs> So there are different foresight practices, uh, one of which I use is a dialogue Delphi. If, if I have a theme and I have people that are interested in the theme, one thing I make sure to do is not to let experts control the discussion. So it's a dialogue. It's not a lecture. It's not a school thing. Um, I, I talk about something called leadingship. The organization today that doesn't allow the most junior people to have a say because they have ideas too. Not, not only junior, but uh, the floor cleaner, 
General Electric, uh, this is a, an apocryphal story, but I, I've never found anybody that's been able to tell me it's wrong. The General Electric headquarters in New York City uh, started to save $3 million a year because a cleaner suggested the change to window blinds. <laughs> now, a cleaner doesn't usually talk to somebody in a country like General Electric that does things. <laughs> he, he cleans and then leaves at the end of the night. But he, he found somebody, made the suggestion, the suggestion went up the chain, the hierarchy, um, showed a little bit of what I call leadership. At some time, every single day, everybody has a little bit to lead with. How Thanks. do we... David, I'm going to... Bed that. I'm going to intervene. And thank you, Raymond. Um, uh, Charles Hall, you will be on deck. Uh, Ted Manning, over to you. Yeah, I just could be cynical and say, why talk when nobody's prepared to listen? Uh, but uh, that leads to the other question that essentially we are working in a power uh, a power situation. And it struck me as we were talking, uh, who is really prepared to share their power so that any of these very good goals and methods and indicators and so on could in fact be used? Because I keep getting the impression that the people who make the decisions now are really not seriously prepared to share any of their power. Ted, I couldn't agree with you anymore. I mean, right now, from two colleagues I have, mm -hmm. that is one of the serious questions being asked at the highest levels in Israel. Yep. Here's a country famous around the world, feared around the world, for its intelligence capabilities and its capabilities to act on its intelligence. Well, it missed the boat. And look what's happened. Um, the, the, the anger, the, the, the... Mm -hmm. one of my friends said he has to go down the back stairs because he works for the military and intelligence. And some of his apartment fellow dwellers are so angry at him for failing. Mm -hmm. yep. So power pride prestige you know i know something you don't know we go all the way back to the the 911 there was a sea full of dots but the 17 or 18 intelligence agencies wouldn't cooperate to draw lines between them so there was no map it was like rain um it's just not it's not new remember pearl harbor <laughs> yeah, right yeah yeah so i mean i haven't been in ottawa for a while but my understanding is that mr harper shut down all but one foresight agency in ottawa looking ahead agency they weren't all called foresight and some people have a nasty impression about foresight and uh, I accept that. I'll take anticipation or looking ahead or imagineering or whatever you I'm want. Next up. Uh, but if there were no, if there are no offices, even small offices, mm -hmm. looking ahead, what happens tomorrow? So, and I go back to you know our previous little discussion here. What can KCOR do? KCOR has got, uh, KCOR has got, KCOR, KCOR should try to do as much as it can to ensure that the next generation of leaders are less willfully blind. Thank you. That, <laughs> yeah, but I agree. I agree with your initial premise. David Pollack, you will be up next. Um, Charles Hall. Well, uh, in the past, several of us have brought 
sort of updates to the Club of Rome and uh, all the sorts of things, which after all, focused on originally, and in my mind still, the limits to growth. And it seems to me that all of your goals, uh, which I like, and, and by your, I mean those that you are reporting on, um, require resources and um, physical resources that may or may not be available. And I'm speaking as an ecologist, I do think, and as a resource ecologist uh, in a way, I think there are likely to be serious limitations um, to the resources available. And my sense is that there is just no consideration of the potential impacts of limits to growth um, in what you have put forth. Um, and I just ask you to comment on that any way you'd like to. And for all of the people here, because we've had several other talks, I'm attempting to integrate a little bit of the various talks we have here. Okay, go. Um, I'm certainly not an economist. I think the two things I never wanted to be were an economist and a lawyer. Neither uh, am I. <laughs> I <laughs> they won't. They won't allow me to be. So, the funding issue. Uh, let me you start with a presentation I saw soon after COVID stopped being a pandemic, and there was something about. Canada not having paid its dues yet. And I can't remember whether it was to the UN or something else. And the, the dues were something in the millions, maybe a hundred million or, or something. And yet, how much money, I mean, in dollar bills, because money went to people, did we spend when we decided we had to, we wanted to, we did, hundreds of billions. There's never no funds. But there's political will, personal choice, uh, uh, power, pride. Um, well, uh, another place that I see this every day is in the United States military. The, America's biggest wars aren't overseas. They're among the services for funding. Funding today, tomorrow, and in the future. And they will, each service will not admit to a fault or do anything even if it will help the grand <clears throat> American security, if it will give an advantage to one of the other services. It will not. So the funding for goals out there is even harder than deciding that we have to pay for something that is happening that we need to address today. I that's why it's and it's only partially frivolous because I you see a report about weekly about some billionaire somewhere who has just given hundreds of millions of dollars to something. Now, in some cases, that's a pride and prestige thing to get his name on a great big business school or something. But in other cases, it's much less august. Uh, Bill Gates foundation um but i you know is there a system for getting a hold of money that is available um does the money it, money is never an object if you don't, I don't want think it to be you're an object. answering my question huh 
I don't think you're answering my question, which okay. is to the people you are reporting on and yourself in your plans, do you consider the implications of the limits to growth model? Or, or do you even argue about it or argue with it? No. Um, Does it enter your sphere? Yeah, oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I agree, whether it's tipping points, uh, whether it's uh, what the end of humanity type thing, um, absolutely. We can't keep going this way. And uh, you must have heard presentations too by people that say, unless we get the population down to 5 billion or something like that, we're going to hell in a handbasket. So absolutely, limits to growth, but growth in well-being, growth in well-being shared across the whole universe, across the 8 billion. For me, the, the limits to growth thing is this obscene increase in the number of billionaires at the same time as there's an obscene increase in the number of poor people, put people in terrible, terrible conditions. So, yeah, yeah, but I, full disclosure, my background is in security, all domain security, national security, homeland security, public safety, natural disaster response, uh, existential threats, the asteroid's going to run into us. Um, so I, I, situation, mission, execution, administration and logistics and command and control. I want to find out really early on who's in command and who's got control. And for some of the things addressing limits to growth, it's who's in control of the purse strings. Very difficult to know, my view. Is that a little better? It... A little better, yeah. Okay. I... <laughs> uh, David Doherty, uh, you'll be on deck. Uh, <clears throat> David Pollock, you're up. Thanks, Ruben. And uh, thanks, uh, David, uh, for the presentation. John uh, Hollins asked the question in the chat to sort of orient where my comments are coming from. He talks about the amount of time that we spent setting goals. Is there an alternative approach? And so I speak only from the vantage point of having spent my life in nonprofit organizations and at different times being invited monthly, weekly, daily to join others in discussions of various possible goals for different campaigns and different actions. We all only have a limited amount of time and resources. And so it became very problematic to me to try to figure out where did you spend your time? And I think that some success may be had in some dimensions from what we might call a praxis approach. It's a kind of action reflection approach. It's where you don't convene a meeting because of the importance of the state actors or the importance of the size of the resources that people have and therefore have a right to sit around the table. What you do is you figure out from your vantage point what is the most important action that you as an individual or a community or a country or a region can take in relation to a problem that you are experiencing? And then you spend some time finding who is agreed with the action that you've determined is a very useful action to try to resolve or make progress on that problem. And the only people that you allow into the room, into that meeting, are the state actors or the individual or the organizations that are already 
priorly committed to the action. Your, your meeting then changes focus and it becomes in a sense to plan the use of the resources and the campaign and you launch the activity. And so in a sense, you're presupposing that as we look out at the world, we know what goals are important to us intrinsically and we come to the conclusion through our best research as to what actions we're prepared to commit to. We band together in clusters of those that would share those actions. And as you go forward, you reflect. And there may then be times when you can build larger clusters and larger communities. But you're not spending your huge amount of time as the globe faces a number of existential threats, I would argue, in trying to bring together huge numbers of state actors to do long-term goal setting, which I think has proven time and again that we've put a lot of resources into black holes and with very often very little to um, show for it all. So my question really, David, is um, while this has seemed to have brought some usefulness in small NGO quarters, do you think an approach like this that doesn't spend the time and the energy on the goal setting, but on finding two or three states that are committed to an action and beginning that action and then trying to build um, momentum and to coalesce around that action. And then as you go to do the reflection about what the next stages, next steps, next action should be. That's my thought anyway. I love it. I, um, another meeting for a meeting's sake, nine times out of 10, doesn't produce anything except the schedule for the next meeting. Uh, you call it the practice approach. Uh, we in the Sustainable and Security Guide, uh, what we are trying to do is to encourage the sort of sharing of information that allows you and I to decide who has common cause, really wants to do a certain action, is involved in working on it now, so you and I can get together and plan and do something rather than just get ready for the next meeting. So the practice approach is very much an underpinning goal <laughs> of the security and sustainability guide. Mm -hmm. My, the problem I've been in the NGO community uh, in large part for years too, not only because of UN peacekeeping and stuff, but in Pugwash for 20 years and, and, and so on. So I uh, truly understand your sort of creed occur. Um, <laughs> I, I found... Everybody's in, regardless of the type of organization you're in, everybody's in, in a competition for place, whether it's place reputation, uh, place productivity, uh, place for funds or whatever. And one of the difficulties I've experienced is when you, even after you learn who else has the same concerns and willingness to act on them as you do, when you sit down with them, it becomes a competition between their organization and your organization. And I haven't yet learned how to deal with that. I, I say sometimes it's through the dialogue, Delphi. I want to get rid of the experts. I want people who are interested in their own human security and willing to do something about it to sit down together and not be lectured to. So I agree. I just, just don't know whether it's very practical. Um, one of the reasons is because let's say you get four 
people or, or organizations together and literally commit to do something about it, then if it's anything substantive or substantial, you will need funds. And you have to get the funds from somewhere. And people who give funds either want to be recognized for giving the funds, which sometimes makes it difficult. You, you must have experienced cases like this where they want to put their logo on top of your project. Um, mm, absolutely. Or they want you to twist your work a little bit so that you can contribute to some of the actions that they want that normally they wouldn't be able to do through their company or organization. Uh, am I making sense? I, I, I'm oh, trying to sh think. Sure, and I think there's rules and ways to proceed to try to limit that, of course. Uh, uh, yes, um, but <laughs> rules rules and laws and limits, very much a personality, uh, how successful they are, very personality driven. Um, I, but bottom line is absolutely practice approach. The last thing we need, uh, as I say, every day I get this long email from the International Institute of uh, Sustainable Development with all the different concepts they're at. And I tell you, I get tired of seeing this line. We discussed in detail methods of improving our ambition. Dear Lord, if you need to have your ambition improved, maybe you're in the wrong business. I agree. <laughs> I, but I. David, I'll just, just add very quickly that um, I remember one occasion where many NGOs came together over a three-day period. And the way in which we finally were able to proceed is we kept trying to build consensus around the, the smallest of items. And, and we locked people in more and more enthusiastically to the notion of getting a sort of a collective plan agreed to. And some of the thorniest ones, of course, were left to later on. But it, by that point, it would have been such a huge embarrassment uh, for the ones that were resisting to walk away from it, that you're able to kind of pull them in through kind of last minute negotiations. And sometimes that approach will will work. And with the people who are funding, I found that um, I've never been in a position where somebody is threatening to walk away if you can't get a, a room or a building named after them. But um, I've often put the limit on organizations that wanted to review educational materials to say, yep, you can absolutely take a look at it, but so can everybody else. And that's where your influence ends. Then it goes into final production and we, we do the call. And if you're not comfortable with that, well, then we don't want your funding. So you, you have to kind of bite the bullet at some point yeah. on those. Yeah. Thank you. What? Thanks very much, David, for your reflection. <laughs> My pleasure. Thank you, David. Um, Michael Marion, you'll be on deck. And Dave Doherty, if you will ask your first question, we'll come back to you for a second. Okay, thank you. Um, David, I'm wondering, is setting goals like creating a mission, vision, and principles? What you do when you have little or no idea how to get anything done or you want to fool people into thinking you're going to do something when you have no such intent. Yes, absolutely. In fact, some of the biggest flameouts I've been involved in have been with groups of people that know that they'll have accomplished everything they need to accomplish if they get the vision and mission right. They, they have no intention of going any further because they're busy on other things. I, yeah. Yep, that's my experience. 
But you see, for them, their goal was to get the mission and vision in place <laughs> because that provides them the flag that they can go from conference to conference with this mission and vision and look for similarly missioned and similarly visioned thinkers. And, and they're our best and brightest. I said earlier, I'm worried that experts are getting in our way. <laughs> yep. Okay, I hope I get a chance to ask my second one, which is a more important question. <laughs> we'll come back to you. Thanks, Ruben. Uh, Samrat, you're on deck. And Michael Marion, you have a question. Yeah. Uh, this has been a very important and provocative presentation, and I hope that it will be written up, published in several places, and followed up and so forth. However, the, the opening question that David posed uh, about will, will there uh, be a new set of, of, of goals? And then he later went on to uh, suggest less than a 50% chance that there would be. Uh, I think it's the wrong question. And uh, because at least uh, from where I sit, I see uh, uh, virtually no chance that there will not be uh, uh, a new set of goals or conversely that 100% of chance that there will be something in 2030. And it's a question of what and uh, what time frame and how they label it and so forth. But the most important question is how to realize these goals. And, and uh, I think that the uh, current crop of goals have been very weak in that. They've been heavy on the uh, uh, indicators and on the on the targets in a exhausting detail, but they pay uh, virtually no attention to the uh, thousands of organizations, uh, some of many of which uh, we've tried to uh, begin to document in the security and sustainability guide that are uh, that are trying to work towards these goals, especially having to do with climate and energy and 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 the oceans. And an interesting thing is that the great majority of these goals uh, of these organizations never mention the SDGs. And I think that the reason is because the SDGs never mention these organizations. But here is a, a great possibility to, uh, to corral some of these organizations, at least, to get them to cooperate better, to pick out the best ideas, to uh, award the best uh, organizations with the most promising ideas. And it's right there in the SDG number 17, Partnerships for the Goals, which is very narrowly construed to just consider national partnerships. When uh, there's all sorts of different associations and uh, alliances and consortia and so forth, we've documented more than 100 of them. And uh, they ought to be identified and, and strengthened in, in, in some way. So I would appreciate uh, comments. To, uh, uh, oh, oh, and I also should add that it's a matter of leadership in the in the uh, for the SDGs that uh, and publicity that uh, at least in the U.S. Uh, they're virtually unheard of, and uh, the, the putative uh, president of the society uh, of the Sustainable Development uh, uh, Solutions Network, Jeffrey Sachs. Uh, you don't see him sticking out of his neck for the uh, SDGs, but instead he's trying to bring peace in, uh, in Ukraine by what I think is a rather futile approach. But anyway, I'd like to have comments uh, from David and others on this. Thank you. Uh, Michael, my boss. <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't, uh, don't use the term boss. That's no, no, no. Term. It, it, yeah, no. I'm, I'm, I'm just a colleague. <laughs> my, my, my leader. We go back a long and speckled way as well. Um, You you used a term there that I, sort of goes back to what Dave Doherty uh, brought up. Um, realize the goals. There are many organizations who believe that once they set the goals, they're realized. They feel they're they have a map. 
that that the goal is their load star, their north star, um, and what is required thereafter is just to keep getting better at expressing them, uh, preparing for them, planning for them. Um, even though they don't have or can't get the people, the money, the time or whatever. That's that's one point. Uh, you used a wor another word that I think I, I should have had somewhere in the presentation and that's about incentivizing people and things. Uh, and I've thought about this in the past a lot, uh, especially in peacekeeping settings, about how you incentivize people who, because of the circumstances and the conflict and the history and culture and so on, they don't want to be incentivized. So I guess I go back to what the business about what's a small issue you can all agree on? Can you lock into that? And if people don't want to lock into a small issue that's clearly of concern to them, uh, another theme that hasn't come up today, and I was thinking about, including, but the business about shaming delinquent players, you know, shame by naming. Uh, and I, again, go back to this conference in Baku that was one of the most gripping for me of the many I've been to, but these young people, they stood in front of these prime ministers and former heads of the African Union and prime ministers and things and put their finger out and pointed right at them and said, this is what you did or didn't do. And this is why we're having so many problems. And this is why when I'm a leader and so on. Uh, but you and I have been in the, the guide since it started and the purpose that you mentioned is one of the purposes. I just, without a lot of publicity or advocacy, which costs a lot of money, I don't know how we can do more than we, than you are doing with these, with the packages, with the guide. Those of you who are with us today that haven't looked at it, www.securesustain.org and find out what we're talking about. But the purpose is to bring people together who will do things. But you can't bring people together until the people know that there are other people out there to be brought together. And I don't know how we can do that better than we're doing. Well, uh, for, for starters, I, uh, as I suggested to you recently, I think that you ought to have a visible coordinator for each of the 17 goals that you have, uh, who uh, tries to bring pe people together. And it's not always going to work. It's going to be messy, but I think that you can get some, somewhat more cooperation and less fragmentation or somewhat more cooperation than you now have and less fragmentation. And uh, fragmentation was uh, the theme that the uh, presentation I made to KCOR uh, some months ago, and it, it's still there, but it's, uh, it's uh, not only in the, in the academic literature of which there is an awful lot, but also, also among the organizations and uh, uh, you just don't uh, don't have anybody uh, doing it. We started to have a project with the uh, SDSN, the uh, Sustainable Development uh, Solutions Network, which is sort of a quasi uh, official arm of uh, of the SDGs. I think it's quasi official, and it's headed so supposedly headed by Jeffrey Sachs, but I don't know what he's doing about it. And we just uh, got, uh, started lo looking into the education organizations and we discovered about 30 organizations uh, that were 
uh, trying to uh, promote uh, sustainability thinking at either the, the lower system and the upper system. And we identified them and uh, and we got a little bit of response, but they didn't seem to be too keen to get together. And uh, you have to kind of push on this, I think, to knock a few heads. And uh, we just never got beyond that because uh, SDSN was too busy with other things. And uh, and so it turned out for we, and we didn't have many resources. So so there we stand. But I can I uh, can readily see by looking at the security and sustainability guide that in any area there's just a huge profusion of organizations and some of them are i i assume to be doing good things and of course they have to make all the uh, publicity about how much good they're doing uh and equate uh, uh equate their goals with realization of the goals uh to, to some degree which is uh, which is what david's saying but but at the same time, I think there's a widespread sense, like uh, David Suzuki, that there's a, a lot of failure of the uh, assumptions and the movements that uh, we've had so far, and we're going to have to rethink that we're, what we're what they're doing. And hey, Michael, I'm uh, okay. Sorry to continue. <laughs> Thank you. We're going to. Um, we have two more questions. I'm not going to let David respond to your comment. We'll just let it sit there. Thank you. <laughs> uh, uh, the uh, Dave Doherty, you will be up for your next question, and Samrat, if you would ask your question. Yeah. Hi, David. Uh, thanks so much for the presentation. Uh, my question is uh, quite simple, and um, I hope it doesn't take up uh, too much time. Yeah. Uh, it's also to uh, Ruben, sir, as well. In the beginning, it's like, um, uh, let's say that no matter of what particular goal and uh, a sustainability goal that uh, one might follow, we are always being told at the receiving end that we don't have too much time. So my question is rather simple. It's like, how much time do we have then, regardless of which plan we choose? Huh. Wow. <laughs> um, I guess I'm going to fall back on my suggestion of 2045, a 15-year time frame. Okay. Um, even today, that's sort of half a generation. Uh, okay. Okay. And we need intergenerational collaboration and cooperation. So we don't have any time to do nothing. But we can spend the time that we do have um, to stop things getting worse if we, one, stop wasting so much time working separately, uh, two, competing, you know, this power and prestige and pride and so on. Uh, Solution. They aren't solutions. They're 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 ideas. Uh, make use of the money that is available. I mean, when I say make use, how do we deploy funds that could be deployed if people and personalities and and systems allowed it, uh, uh, allowed it, uh, allowed it to be eligible, and and I, I think we have to get a much noisier, noisier input to this finger pointing from the young and the young professionals. Uh, I, well, the voting age in Canada, what is it, 18? <laughs> I, I think so. But with social media and all these other things, why isn't it 16? They can drive a car at 16 so they can wreck havoc uh, in a car or something like this. And so, until the young generation and especially young professionals, people that have been uh, have vocational training or been to university or or have had experience, have the space and the will to stand up in front of election desiring politicians to put their finger out. Uh, this generation needs help. 
This this generation of leadership needs help. And they're where we're going to get it from. I'm sure okay. there's a lot of people of my age and your age who want things to be better. Um, but for a whole bunch of reasons, they're inactive or unable to act or 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 whatever. The young. We've got to get the young out there. Okay. Thank you so much. Dave Doherty, the last question is yours. Thank you. I'll try to keep it short. Is it correct to understand that the socioeconomic sphere has taken over the agenda? There's almost no attention being paid to protecting the biosphere in which we depend. If we continue to try to ignore it, the consequences will be worse than we can imagine. I think this has bubbled to the surface several times already in the discussions today, but I'd like your opinion on it. Yeah. Um, I, I, I warm to your question, but can you define for me socioeconomic? What? Well, it, I mean, if you look at, for example, the uh, MDGs and the SDGs, uh, let's say that the, that the set is eight. You're lucky if one of them has anything to do with protecting uh, the atmosphere, the oceans, biodiversity, uh, you know, any of that stuff. If if you got 17 sustainable development goals, they're probably all on something like poverty. Yeah, no. Um, I, I, I won't come out and destroy uh, maybe a lot of personal reputation by making a comment, but the minute the MDGs sort of got settled in place and the SDGs got settled in place, the system imposed focuses on them. And the focuses were primarily socio. But the socioeconomic situation is really serious now because A, Uh, how many countries are richer than must? How many countries have more money than Musk? That's almost a frivolous question because it's not how many countries have more money, but how many countries have more, in effect, discretionary money than Musk has? That's the important question. Uh, three? I don't know. Um, the economic controls are intensifying. E sorry, economic influences, economic drivers are intensifying. You read any political statement, and of course, uh, Grumman and all these uh, Raython and their, uh, the advertisers, and they point out how they're Efforts on behalf of our security uh, ensure good, good, high-paying jobs and increasing prosperity and everything. Who? Pretty narrow. Pretty narrow. Uh, and what stocks are going up these days because of what's happening in the world? They aren't the stocks of uh, baby clothes and food and stuff. It's weapons and technical things um i uh, i agree with you but again this is a political choice and this is not good for the next generation's well-being for me the ridiculous situation of the mdgs and the sdgs you can't find the word security anywhere you can't find it anywhere, even in the heyday of human security. And I don't care which one you're talking about, but well-being, security, personal. So I, I, I'm, I'm now worried that all our discussion today is maybe even less than 40% for new goals. 
<laughs> Thank you. And with that, uh, thank you, David, and you will be thanked more formally on behalf of KCOR. Yes, very uh, happy to hear that, David. You can always tell a success by the number of interesting questions that are asked afterwards. Uh, I remember when I worked with, with Brundtland, we used a single thing that got an awful lot of buy-in. It was lots of everything for everyone forever. And a lot of people bought in, and it got an awful lot more complicated after that. And as you have quite rightfully identified, we have uh, spent an awful lot of time uh, developing the goals, developing the metrics, and so on. I mean, I spent over a week and a half just on one subsection of one little part of, of Sustainable Development Goal 12 for Canada at one point. Uh, me and thousands of others who contributed to a massive morass. So I think it's very relevant what you have uh, have said, and the coordination of it is at least as big a task as the task itself, apparently, now. Uh, yeah, well, could I please, Art, can you put up the appropriate here? This is to thank you for your presentation on behalf of the Canadian Association of the Club of Rome, and also to, again, ask those who have been uh, able to come and talk and contribute questions to please stick with us. Please visit uh, the address on the screen, httpcanadiancore.com, and it has the all of the upcoming presentations. We'll get to 200, not too far ahead. And... Uh, Definitely, they are staying of a very high caliber. And my metric on this one is how good are the questions. So again, thank you all very much for coming. If you want to see any of the current or past presentations, they are on YouTube. And again, that can be found on our, uh, on our CanadianCore.com site. So once again, subscribe if you like it. And uh, we hope to see you again next week. So thank you all very much. And Art, 